Uh, thus, Hermes gives us the relationship of parent and child as far as this can be applied to an abstract theological uh, concept. Deity is parent, total parent, father, mother. Hermes pointed out the deity is androgynous, namely possessing within itself the qualities of father, mother. But more than this pertains, partakes of a still stranger extension. For this deity, which is father and mother, is also the progeny of father and mother. Thus, deity is father, mother, child. Deity gave birth out of itself to all things, and these, by their unions and minglings, cause further generations, and these later generations are like the original creation in God and of God. Hermes, therefore, like the Gnostics, envisioned a hierarchy, a universe of powers, principalities, angels, archangels, thrones, and dominions. He saw not only the great fountain of all things, but uh, closely followed the Chaldean oracles in describing the father fountains from the great fountains, the powers and the minds that flow forth from the power and the mind. He conceived of Anthropos and Anthropos the son of Anthropos. He beheld in the unfolding of universal existence, the opening of a great flower, reminiscent of the vision of Dante. And as the petals of this universal blossom, this rose of the troubadours, opened in the light of the divine sun, it revealed a universe of splendid majesty, an infinitely unfolding chorus of powers, hymning the eternal, and all to various degrees revealing and asserting this tremendous fountain of fountains, this father cause of all that exists. From these reflections, the Hermetic teaching uh, organizes the universe into hierarchs, into descending orders of beings, from those completely divine to those possessing heroic potentials as demigods and supermen. There were not only celestial orders of deities, but there were sidereal orders, and there were terrestrial orders, and even subterranean orders, again following the Eleusinian and Orphic concepts of the Grecians. These orders of life filled all space with life, so that there was not anywhere where there was not life. The Hermetic masters of later time, particularly in the early alchemistical period, extended this thinking still further, laying the groundwork for such fantasies as the Comte de Gabelet, this mysterious story of elemental beings and creatures, and also opening the road to an extreme demonism based upon the demonism of the classical uh, world of thought. The next point that I think is important to us is the opinion of Hermes concerning the nature of what we term the Messiah. The Egyptians certainly had a messianic tradition. We know that in the later centuries of Egyptian religion, their form of messianic concept was drifting closer and closer to that with which we are now familiar. As early as the 5th or 6th century BC, the Egyptians had already come into the recognition of an intercessing power in nature, an intercessor, a power of salvation or preservation. And this power they variously symbolized. One of their names 
used for this power was Jesus, a name which is startlingly reminiscent of Jesus. In the Hermetic philosophy, we do not have exactly the Christian presentation of the messianic concept. We do have, however, a concept. As Pythagoras had earlier taught, the only way in which division can be countenanced in the concept of a total divine power is that division is within that power, but that that power itself remains undivided. Thus, in the Hermetic philosophy, a certain division occurs within totality. And this division blazes forth not as a separateness, not as a power brought into any possible antagonism with its own cause, but a power which is a somewhat restricted manifestation of totality. That power Hermes calls the divine mind. He calls it also universal reason. He says that the firstborn of the infinite is the extension of the infinite itself into the field of pure cognition. Therefore, that the first act of the first creation is to uh, worship the Creator. Mind, therefore, by its natural inclination, turns toward its Creator, and pure cognition venerates above all other things the source of itself. This mind, in the Hermetic philosophy, becomes the only begotten of the Father. It becomes, strangely, both the only begotten and the firstborn. And in this Hermes is in no more difficulty than some other schools. For we refer to Jesus as the only begotten, and at the same time, assume that deity is the creator also of ourselves. Therefore, Hermes begins to ponder the problem of the difference between the begotten and the created. Also, the difference in a kind of generation. And comes to the conclusion that mind or reason is the product of a peculiar kind of creation a kind of creation that is never again repeated. That in the, pro in the projection of the divine mind, to borrow an Eastern term, deity creates by will and yoga alone. The deity, by the pronunciation of a determination within its own nature, engenders within itself that aspect of itself which is mind. This mind or this cognition then becomes, strangely, the instrument of the divine purpose. It becomes the apex of the ascending pyramid of creation and the base of the descending period, uh, pyramid of the creating power. Thus, in the Hermetic philosophy, mind is a kind of savior. But Hermes was not perturbed with some of the peculiar situations that later arose in Christian theology. He was not preserved, he was not concerned with the problem of a mind preserving something otherwise lost. He was not confronted with the need for a saving mind, as we know it. He was rather in need of the concept of an instructing mind. In the Hermetic doctrine, also called redemption, or regeneration, or restoration, or the transmutation of things inferior into a superior state or condition, is the result of the power of the revealing mind. It is due to the fact that through the revealing or the unfolding principle of reason, all things become aware of reality. A regeneration is awareness of reality. It is not a rescuing from sin, but a restoration from not knowing. 
It is the creature becoming aware more and more completely of the universal reality in which it exists. By the Hermetic concept, therefore, there can be only one kind of wisdom, and that is the wisdom by which man is capable of becoming totally aware of the total existence of deity, by which man can also become aware that all diversity is an illusion, and that what we call division is merely the result of limited sensory instruments which are unable to attain a state of total cognition. Universal reason, having come forth out of the eternal, becomes next to the eternal the most immortal of all creatures. Yet this wisdom is not in itself immortal. Nous, or reason, or mind, with its overtone in hermetic speculation, a mind which is pure cognitional reason in itself, is therefore the most aged and the most immediate of all things. Mind must therefore, in its fullness, to return to its full archetypal proportion, contain within itself the absolute experience of itself, Reason, therefore, must lead to what perhaps we may first conceive of as understanding. Understanding being more than knowing. Understanding being an enlightened kind of knowing. A human knowing impregnated with a spark of divine knowing. <laughs>